So we got Kevin Matthews, finally. How's it going in Singapore? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, everything's uh, good. Um, the You know, everything uh, with the COVID uh, restrictions is all lifted, more or less. It's virtually zero COVID restrictions now. So life is kind of returning to pseudo-normal, I guess. Yeah. It's really cool. And... Um... To get right into this, uh, you have a new um, album out called Time yeah. Flies, yep, which yep, yep. began in uh, 2020, at least as far as the writing process. But to preface that, I'd like to take you way back um, to the beginning. When you were a kid, <laughs> what was your musical kid, yeah. environment like? Um. When I was a kid, um, uh, you know, my dad, he he was uh basically a, a pop culture nut. So he really like was into music, film, TV. So that's really what the environment that I was growing up in. So he had a lot of uh you know records of the day, uh, but really more of a generation, more of his generation. So he had uh, music like you know Sinatra and and Bing Crosby, um, Andy Williams was one of his favorites, and and he had kind of you know all these compilation LPs with various uh, artists and so forth. Funnily enough, the first real exposure I had to so called pop music, um, you know that I would be, that would become part of my life was actually the Beatles, but mm -hmm. sung by Chipmunks. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, and that was a 1960s vinyl. I can still remember the cover, the chipmunks in front, playing guitars and stuff. Yeah, so that's the first time I heard the Beatles, actually, was sung by the chipmunks. <laughs> Through chipmunks, wow. Yeah, that, yeah. so that's how I first discovered the Beatles, and then it kind of uh, kind of went on from there when I, uh, and then when I kind of hit um, puberty, so to speak, right, when I was 11 or 12, uh, I watched this movie called Swalk, sealed with a loving kiss, and the mm -hmm. soundtrack was for well, soundtrack was by uh, the Bee Gees. Oh wow! So that was like a, you know total, you know I have a few of these kind of uh, epiphanies uh, in terms of music. That was definitely an important one. Uh, sitting in you know is and it was a movie about puppy love and and things like that. And it, you know I was that age, same age as the protagonists, right? They were all eleven or twelve years old. Oh wow! So it's very very cool. yeah. So it's very very engaging. I mean back then it was, uh, Jack Wild, uh, Mark Lester, Tracy Hyde. So I don't know whether you've heard of them, but yeah. Um, Mark Lester, I think, and Jack Wild, they did go on to do more stuff. Tracy Hyde, I think she didn't. But it was like all these BG songs, um, to love somebody uh, in the morning, oh, wow. uh, classics of me and all that. Yeah, yeah, all the classics. So that's when I really like, you know, became obsessed with, you know, it was like, that was like the kind of a, you know, light bulb kind of moments. Like, oh, okay. So then, <laughs> at the time, uh, you were focusing on originals as far as like the writing was concerned. Um, so the writing didn't happen till maybe I was 15. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that I had a group of friends and we had, I think like one year ago, we had started uh, forming a band, mm -hmm. right? Just to play, well, to play Beatles covers, basically. That was the purpose of the band. So this is like in the early 70s, 73, 74. Right. There, I, yeah. So then one day, uh, one of the guys in the band came to my, came to my home actually, and he said, "Hey, I don't, you gotta hear something." He he played me a song that he had just wrote, or he had just written, and I remember I was insanely jealous. You okay. know, that's the only thing that I was thinking. It's like, what the hell? I I gotta do this right. So that's really like the inspiration for it. I remember I just couldn't sleep that night because I was just thinking, oh, how come we can write a song and I, I haven't been able to do it? Or well, I, have, I have never even thought of it. And then that night, I kind of woke up in the middle of the night and, and I took out, uh, back then they had these, uh, you know, a pianica where you blew into it and played. Oh, wow. And that's I, I was like 15 or 14 or whatever it was. And then I wrote a song 
uh, that night. Uh, <laughs> oh wow! Of, based you know, on that, based on that melody. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So I wrote a song based on the melody. Yes. Um, uh, and his song was called "My Love." I think that's what it was called. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's really cool. Um, hearing about your early songwriting efforts. You mentioned the early seventies, <laughs> and in the Singaporean context, um, that's mm. actually. That's actually when the supposed clampdown on music was happening. So what was the basis of that? Was that like, like I heard, you know, from Chris Ho and like the interview that he did, like clubs would close and like basically playing like amplified kind of blues rock. It wasn't, was it banned or was it just discouraged? Um. Okay, so based on you know talking to the people who were musicians at the time, it was a band. Okay. So basically, yeah, they sh basically shut down all live music venues. This was like 73, 74. Just about the time I was getting into music. <laughs> yeah. So they just the, yeah, that's down. why I wanted to bring it up. <laughs> yeah. So they shut down everything. So like there are stories about uh the musicians, like usually a lot of the the venues were in hotels mm -hmm. so they go to the hotel and then let's say it's a bar or what and they'll just be locked up you know literally chains and everything right i'm not sure how 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 a lot of these descriptions may be a bit overblown because it's very emotional for them so they'll say things like oh they were you know chains everywhere <laughs> i'm not sure how true that is but that's what they say la. so they say that oh and then all our gear was inside and we couldn't get hold of the gear and then we had to go to the managers and they'll say, Oh, sorry, I mean it's everything's just banned, everything's just closed. So, wow. so, so like literally overnight they, they had no no jobs, nothing. You know? Wow. So it was bad, I guess, more so for the musicians making a living playing music, but for the consumers more such as yourself you mm. kind of just had a field day as far as like exploring different types of music and like it, it was it was the musical selection as far as like you know singaporean music was it like the remnants of you know the late 60s was still kind of there and then you had like western union band like mm. a little bit kind of just getting their foot in the door Okay, so as far as as the the music recordings and stuff like that, I think even in 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 the mid seventies, there was not much uh, Singapore original music. Yeah, you, just you like find, Anita Sarawak yeah, and Tracy Wong. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, like, if you go to record stores, you could really not really find that much Singapore music. So I I don't remember actually seeing much back then. Yeah, so I think it, it had to do with, uh, you know, this general uh, thing about, you know, the government supporting uh, Singapore music so much because they didn't want Singaporeans to be playing music so much. And even if, you know, music from overseas, a lot of stuff was also banned as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, because, you know, you, the usual kind of suspects. Like, yeah, the, the band on songs. Yellow Culture. Yeah, yeah, Yellow Culture, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that kind of thing. So so a lot of stuff was banned, but of course, you know, people did stop people from so-called smuggling in. <laughs> oh, man. So bringing in just, stuff from overseas, yeah. So it really was, uh, it really was kind of a frustrating, but also pretty much an exciting time because through the 70s, um, you kind of developed your songwriting chops, your your kind of your mojo as a musician. And when did you, about when did you start recording? Was that like in the 80s? Yeah. So so in the 80s, uh, because like, you know, same guys who, the same guy who kind of uh, motivated, me, motivated me to, to, uh, start writing music. So we kind of, you know, were still working together. Uh, and he basically had uh, gone overseas. He had gone to Canada to, to study, actually. 
So like in the 80s, we were already like, let's say in our early 20s, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so so he he had uh, bought a, he had gotten a Tiak Porto studio, which was the first uh, portable recording device, right? Which is multi-track for commercial, in the commercial market back then. This is maybe 83 or 82, 83 around okay. there. Okay. Wow. So yeah. that's big. <laughs> yeah. So that was huge. It was huge. And, and, and it was, I think it was maybe a, a thousand or two thousand dollars back then, which is a lot of money. Right. Yeah. This friend of mine is quite well to do. So, so that was not an issue for him. So he had a little kind of like a home studio in his house uh, with drums and everything. So that's really my first real experience of recording. So we were recording like our so-called demos, uh, our band demos, you know, on this four track thing. And basically it's, it's really what it uses. It uses a normal cassette and it has four hits. So it kind of splits the cassette into four. So it's a four track recording machine. Like what, mm -hmm. what the, what we had in the sixties. <laughs> oh wow! So yeah. so it was so it was like uh, your solo stuff, or was it like the stuff that you did was the band? What was the name of your band that you had? So the band was Watchmen. Oh, that that was Watchmen. Yes. So the name kind of came about late seventh, late eighties because of the comic book. So basically, I named the band because I love the you know the 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 seminal uh, comic book by Alan Moore. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. so that's why we called we called it Watchmen. So we started really seriously recording demos, uh, because you know they 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 would I mean because he and his brother so his brother was a guitarist in the band so it's basically three of mm -hmm. us, and and basically he would just come back during uh, holidays, right when he's got his school holidays, and he he, and basically basically we he started we got started getting more serious about recording demos. I think in the second half of the eighties. Mm -hmm. So that's what that was what it was. So we had like a, a cassette full of, you know, our songs. So some of them were my songs, some of them were were his songs. Uh and, and that, that was basically uh what happened. Uh <laughs> and then we in eighty eight or eighty nine, uh we really wanted to do something with the music. So someone introduced I can't remember who, someone introduced me to this producer guy i can't even remember his name all right so he went to the dude's uh office right so 80, 89 i would have been a late 20s right so this guy was like a year older than me so we're like both of us were late 20s so we bring our demo cassette right to this guy and he he, he has a cassette play puts it in he listens yeah. to it forwards and listens to it then he's like, looks at us and says, you guys are too old to make pop music. Is he serious? <laughs> what yeah, the, what the yeah. hell? Like, like Chris, okay, Ho, Chris Ho was like 28 when he did Regal Vigor. Like, what? Yeah. We're too old. <laughs> We're not even 30 yet back then, you know? Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you're in your late twenties. That's a death sentence. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like so bizarre. So then he fished out uh, a, a a cassette, right? And he said, "Oh, you know, you, you need to make music like this." So it was uh, it was called first time. I think it was a compilation of so called fresh face young singers. Yeah, I think you one were of them. young. <laughs> can you so they you were young. So they had singers like uh, Jessica Sue. Yeah, and, I, I have her CD actually. Sean DeMello, I think. Yeah, that yeah. Was the, and it was basically just you know pop music, I guess. Yeah, yeah, very light. So he was fair. basically so he was basically telling us, yeah, you guys should just give up. <laughs> yeah, oh man, oh man, I actually have. Speaking of speaking of Watchmen. Speaking of kind of jumping forward a bit, the 90s, mm. this is yeah, like yeah. when you did, uh, what was it? Um, uh, Orchard Road and yeah. Please Believe Me. Um, I actually yeah. remember you from your Democracy album that you put yeah. out 
1993, and you had the song yeah. uh, My One and Only. Yes, that's right. So actually, My One and Only was on that demo cassette. Oh, yeah? A, a version of it, yes, yeah. Uh, and in fact, Orchard Road was as well. So all these songs were actually demoed, you know, in the 80s, right? So, mm -hmm. so basically, what happened then is that, you know, my friends... The, the other band guys kind of went back to the US and I just thought, you know, that's it, you know, um, that's the end of me trying to do anything with the, with the music, right? And mm -hmm. then I came across Big O. So actually that's when I came across Big O, just about the same time, 89, 90 as well. Yeah. I came across Big O and I came across this you know, this another kind of epiphany moment yeah. where, you know, you know, back then Chris Ho was writing um, uh, for Straight times uh, like yeah he was the and, pop yeah, columnist pop life yeah, the yeah pop, pop, columnist. Life. <laughs> pop life is called and then there was this big photograph i remember in he was the odd fellows you know yeah and, oh and, man uh, and i was like looking i was guys. looking at this photograph and thinking why are these guys in the newspaper right good deal <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, because the Oddfell has just put out their demo and he actually like yeah. put it highly yeah. on his like Yeah, it, music and I was show. yeah. And I was reading it and it was, and it was like, What? You can do this? They had a demo and they just recorded it and just put it out and it's in a newspaper. God, it's God like, bless Chris right? Ho. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. So that kind of motivated me. I think hey, we could do something about it. So I, basically what I did was I compiled the, the demo cassette and I and, this time I sent it to Big O, right? And they loved it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So that's what happened, you see, because like that producer guy basically told us, forget it. But you know, thank God for Big O. And when they got the, all, the same cassette, basically, they kind of fell in love with it. So like, as, as far as like forming like the Democracy album, I remember uh, you also had a song on that <laughs> album called The High Cost of Living. And uh, I actually have it on another compilation, though. But Chris Ho was very fond of your writing style. He was like, oh, you have, like, kind of, like, protest kind of chops. Did you believe <laughs> yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it was kind of strange when he was telling me that. But, I mean, I, I had made a decision when I started writing those kind of so-called local-centric uh, songs to kind of do something that was different. So to write songs about Singapore, which I mean, apart from Dick Lee, uh, nobody else is really doing it. I have <laughs> Dick Lee stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and I was a huge fan of, of the Kings, uh, Ray Davies and Ray Davies yeah. always wrote about, you know, England and wrote about London and, you know, and stuff like that. So, Orchard Road was, you know, stuff like Orchard Road uh, really is, was inspired by the Kings. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to do a, a Kings Singapore song more, more, more than anything else. Um, so really, that's kind of how it started. And thanks to the big old guys, because they kind of really wanted to push me out there because they really loved my songs. And that's they helped me to really, really help me to get the, the, the recording contract for Democracy. Oh wow! Did it inspire yes. you a lot more? Did it like get your juices flowing again? Like you know, because yeah, yeah, of course, of course it did. I mean, yeah, I mean it's, it's crazy how how it works out because, um, like I said, you know, you had this one kind of moment where somebody is telling you forget it, right, give up, yeah. kind of thing, and the same cassette when listened to somebody by somebody else, you get a totally opposite kind of response. Right. And and like I say, fair play to those guys. They really just took it and just ran with it. They just pushed and pushed and pushed. Right. So they really supported local music and local musicians whom they felt, you know, uh deserve some kind of attention. Yeah. Right. All all the way to actually helping me getting a recording contract, which has been pretty insane back Yeah, then. and then, and you also had um around the same time or maybe it was a year after that you um also had a contribution i was holding up a new school yeah. rock uh yeah, yeah. three and yeah. uh you also had uh like a, a splinter project called the crowd on left of the dial i love singapore 
was that kind of like um like a heavier version of of Watchmen or something? Okay, so the thing about um for me, I tend to just write and record depending on my mood mm -hmm. at the time. So I don't, I don't personally believe I have a style, so to speak. Okay. I just kind of do whatever feels. So I, I mean, I basically very influenced by the Beatles because they kind of did anything under the sun. Yeah, of course. And also, and yeah, and also Queen. I because Queen, if you listen to the albums, just like everything. Yeah. Every different style. They don't really. You can't pigeonhole and say. Okay, <laughs> Very beginning, they were a completely different band, and then they transformed, yes. and that's kind yeah. of like what you were going for. Yes. So I mean, these are the bands that really kind of had a lot of impact on me. So I always wanted that. Always want believed in that kind of so-called freedom, and and eclecticism. Yes. No, I you know, I love bands who are eclectic who can kind of change from one. Although sometimes I got criticized for that, say, "Oh, you don't have one style; you're inconsistent." It's like, oh, why is that? A yeah. Why is that a criticism? Yeah, so, I mean that's that was the kind of thing. So, like when it came to, uh, recording, I love Singapore. I was actually, uh, wanted to do something that was, um, heavier, more indie rock kind of thing. So that's why I got uh, Ben Harrison. In to do the guitar. Ben Harrison, he's actually yeah. from the Padres, right? With Joe yeah, Alden. Yeah. Yes, he was he played the Padres. Uh he had a he had his own uh band. Uh in the early days he had this band called Electric Penguin and uh, Electric Penguin. I think I remember yeah. him mentioning <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then of course his own his own outfit, uh, etc. So <laughs> so I've always loved his guitar work. So I just dragged him into <laughs> do it. He did a fantastic job on it. Um, yeah, so you know, <laughs> and as far as and as far as that collaboration, I mean, you also did hold on some more. <laughs> yeah, remember yeah, yeah. the uh, um, the the movie compilation uh, that I showed you before? Um, yeah, you, um, yeah. my favorite movie that you, um, because you also do composing, and I yep. also wanted to uh, mention your you know composition work you've done really good on 12 stories from this movie pack um how did you originally get into those composing opportunities did people <laughs> reach out to you and you're like hey we like you know what you do please write for this I movie mean, i mean it's all basically one person it's basically eric Koo. all right yeah it's, eric Koo, the man the yeah, legend the man the man yeah, the man, the legend. Yeah, so Eric, uh, what happened is that, again, it goes back to Big O. So Big O actually uh, kind of put us together uh, because they wanted us to do a comic strip together. That's really how it started. So I was supposed to write it because I, I've always been a huge, huge comic book geek. And I mean, Watchmen, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so Eric was the artist. So this is before he had done any of his films. So, uh, and, you know, so basically we kind of met up, uh, I think about 1990 and he was like, he was like 24 he was, he was, he was a young dude. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And so we met up, we really hit it off and he, you know, we used to kind of, sh I, I'll share with him my various demos and stuff and he became a huge fan of my music. Right. So, you know, and when he did his first movie, uh, which is a groundbreaking movie for Singapore, Meepok Man. Yeah, so Meepok Man. He, he wanted me to to score one sequence in the movie, and I kept kept resisting. I kept telling him, "No, that's not. I don't do that. I I, I write pop music. I don't write for film. You know that." And I was also not confident about it. Okay, basically, I had doubts about my own ability, but he kind of insisted. And he oh, that's good literally dragged me down to the studio you know and then and he just and he knows my music so well that he kind of played the sequence on video yeah. and then he said okay you have this song little girl lost can you just play an instrumental version of it and that's what you hear on the in the movie mm -hmm. because, and, and, he, and, did it, and he did it and he kind of like that again epiphany right so i get oh i can do this right so he really believed in me when even when i didn't believe in myself and then after that, he said, 
uh, you know, two, a year or two after that, I said, would you score my next movie? And I just said, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I love 12 stories. That's when it got like my first kind of taste of you as a composer. And like, seriously, that theme music of the movie is just, <laughs> it's stuck in my head, man. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting story about that too, because what happened was that um, because his his office has always been in, in Goodwood Park Hotel. So he so what he did was uh there was an afternoon and he dragged the piano into the office. Right. right? <laughs> and then he, then in front of a TV back then, of course it's just a little TV 96 or whatever it was. And then he put in a cassette, it was a rough cut of 12 stories. And he asked me to, okay, I'm going to lock you in here for three hours. And he's just going to come up with the score. So well, that's what happened. Basically, basically on the spot in real time. On the spot. Yeah, in real time. So he came out with that. And then basically what you hear is basically uh, was uh, arranged and produced by uh, John Kompa and, and Yao. Right. Yeah. So, and yeah, so... But you know, based on and Yao is that, uh, he was uh, <laughs> he was uh, in in Zirkel Lounge, right? With yes, uh, exactly. Band. Yeah, he's in Zircon, so you can see the music scene right here. Is you know? Oh yeah, I can see that like right collaboration, together. like each person kind of working in their magic and speaking further with that collaborative energy. You were also <laughs> you also did some stuff with. Uh, the fast colors with Patrick Chung the, from the Odd Fellows. Uh, talk about that a little bit again together with them. Yeah, so so for fast colors, of course, I mean I've always been, um, you know, a huge uh, fan of Patrick, uh, and you know Patrick, you know we've always done stuff together, uh, and together with Chris To as well. So Chris To who was uh, with A Wall. Yeah, A Wall. I remember that. A-Wall. So another great, another great local band. So we kind of got together and said, hey, let's kind of do some <laughs> covers together, classic rock covers. That was the original idea, just to form a so-called covers band. Uh, and then it kind of morphed into as playing, you know, local covers as well. Right. Which was actually inspired by something that Joe Ng had done. So Joe yeah. Ng had a, had a band called Local Bar Boy, right? Yeah. So he had kind of put together some uh, musicians called, and they formed this band called Local Bar Boy way before Fast Colors. And the, the sole purpose of that band was to to do covers of local music. So mm -hmm. when they kind of broke up and stopped doing it, we kind of, you know, they passed the baton to us, so to speak. <laughs> and then we kind of just carried on uh, doing that. Um, so, I mean, so that, I mean, from that kind of, collaborative spirit that's really how yeah kind of and then we it. and then we transition into uh your new stuff time flies which sees like a return to working with those guys i know you've been writing this album since 2020 but then um when did you get together with uh, the fast colors and you also um worked with uh ben ung and then ray aziz too yeah so so well actually um for ray actually started playing uh with the crowd and popland as well together yeah. with uh, that's that's with your Ray other project too popland right? yes popland yeah so with tim nolan so tim nolan is uh my bass player so, so we kind of had a three piece this is like late 90s so at one time, uh, I had one album released under the crowd, which was released by Pony Canyon, actually. Oh, Pony uh, Canyon, yeah. Yeah, so Jimmy Wee. Um, Jimmy like Wee, nice. the great yes. pop man, you know. Great, He's yeah, responsible the for the Lizards convention, for Humpback Oak, for, you know, all the indie yep. scene. Yep, yep. Very, very big, big player back then. Very important to the scene as well. Um so yeah, so actually he was the one that recommended because they'll just be a basket two piece and wanted to start playing live, and then he recommended Ray. So that's when we first met Ray, ninety six. It's like a long time ago now, um, and yeah, so ninety seven onwards we were playing, and Ray was my drummer from then. So he was like really the has been a, been my drummer for quite a long time, and 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 so when I started 
started to do the solo stuff um, or under my name because previously I always, I always used these other band names. Um, so Pat actually was the one who said, because he had a home studio and he wanted, he was very encouraging to say, hey, you need to record, you know, more stuff. And, you know, I'll record it for you and stuff in my home studio and stuff like that. So that's where so-called uh, the, the first solo album came out 10 years ago now, uh, mm-hmm. Emo Fascism. So Emo Fascism basically was based on, on that. Um, and, and basically it was, it was just me and Pat, basically there was nobody else playing on it. So it's mainly quite electronic. Mm-hmm. Pat did a very good job as a electronic drummer. So so after that, I kind of decided, okay, I'm gonna record an album with the full band. So that was present sense, and that's mm-hmm. when I dragged in uh, some of these guys. In fact, when I, when I kind of took emo fashion on tour in Singapore, so to speak, that's when I kind of formed the band and and dragged in some of these guys like Nelson and and Ben and 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 Pat, of course, and so forth. Right, so these guys have already been playing with me for some time, um, but you know I hadn't kind of done anything uh, since then. So when I decided to to do this uh, the new album, you know, I, there was only one thing uh, in my mind is to get these guys back together. <laughs> yeah, again. especially post COVID and everything. You know, you just wanted to right. Oh, let's kind of you know, get together again and, you know, there's kind of this emotional resonance to getting back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. getting getting the guys back together. So Time yeah. Flies was basically, what was it, your rudiments from 2020 onwards, but, like, fleshed out in full band form? Actually, actually, the songs themselves were written before 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah. So because, you know, um, I write a lot of songs. So in, in a five-year period, let's or you know, five-year period 2015 to 2020, I've written a lot of songs, hundreds of songs. So um I I just was kind of cherry picking, you know, what what to because the idea late 2019 was that okay, I have a I wanted to record in 2020. That was the idea. And then COVID happened, you see. So mm-hmm. that that's really why it took another three years to kind of put it together. Um, so I actually had the songs. Um, uh, at the end of twenty nineteen, I had all the songs already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just a question of deciding which songs to record, uh, and 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 that's it. And I, I I made a lot, a lot of changes along the, the way. You know, in the, in the three years I was waiting for COVID to kind of end, where we could finally put it together, I kept thinking and rethinking the the song list, mm-hmm. uh, and fi- finally made a decision. <laughs> Thanks mainly to this other friend of mine. His name is Mike Spinks. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was kind of telling me to that you know your your album should kind of tell a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I kind of chose the songs to kind of tell a story. So that's how it and what, ended up. And what, what would you uh, conceptualize Time Flies would be? Would, would it be like kind of um, you starting off in, in your younger days and kind of figuring yourself out to how you are now? Or is it like vignettes of like different eras of your life? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of both to some extent. Um, I guess it was meant to even though the songs were written before COVID, um COVID kind of had its impact on it as you would imagine so this this idea of uh reflection you know i mean i think all of us kind of went through that <laughs> during COVID, reflecting mm-hmm. about the end of the world and things like that right so um so it's a bit of that so i guess you could say like like some of the earlier songs are a bit more about uh, a bit, you know, having lost the way, and then it kind of, you kind of get kind of this epiphany moments, which I talk about a lot, um, in the middle, and then towards the end, it's kind of there's a kind of resolution, right? So it has a, I guess it has a tree acting to a certain extent, like a story. So, yeah, yeah, and uh, how do you feel after? writing the album i i bet like you say you write hundreds of songs you have so much more planned right yeah, yeah, yeah. so 
So yeah, I, t- I intend to like a lot of songs that I cut out, which I really do like a lot of great uh, stuff that I really like, which I intend to record for uh, maybe in the last quarter of this year. The so called coins because this year is the 30th anniversary of uh, democracy, my one and only, and all that. So, yeah, so the idea is to to record in a kind of similar vein as <laughs> democracy to come up with something that is kind of in a similar style but updated, of course, I mean, 30 years later, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's awesome. Like, my favorite track on the whole album has to be the song B. And I know that was oh. your like very adventurous, sound, very spacious. You got the sitar playing. It's like, um, like just you're almost like you're coming in and out of consciousness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so B, um, actually B was probably the hardest, uh, song to put together we always kind of saved it for last because we had a lot of issues executing it trying to because we basically recorded the backing tracks live yeah wow so it's very different from if you uh the demo itself because it's 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 uh done in a in a different tuning it's a drop d tuning right um so it's a it's a bit of a meant to be a drone yeah so uh so when we kind of record it trying to record it with it was very challenging, but we kind of managed to find. Uh, so I'm quite pleased with that. We kind of managed to find to resolve some of the uh, musical challenges we had with that, and and the whole. I, and I'm glad that you like it, and and you you know, and that your own response to it sounds very much like what we was trying to achieve with it. This idea of you know, because I I suffer from anxiety. I know, so. me too, big time, ever since childhood. <laughs> so th- that's actually what I saw. Like when I would see your posts, I would be like, me and this guy, like, you know, right then and there. Yeah, so, you know, is it trying to kind of express uh, the psychological sense of how it feels sometimes to be anxious, that sense of a drone and how it takes over. <laughs> Right, very subconsciously takes away, and you don't even know yeah. what is happening. Yeah. What other tracks throughout the album stick out to you? Um, I mean, for me, um, personally, it would be. I think all I want is yeah. is a very important song for me. Um, it really kind of reflects. Uh, where I am in my life to a certain extent because I've I've suffered uh, quite a lot of uh, emotional so-called romantic disappointments yeah yeah um, relationships and stuff like that so yeah. again epiphany moment in the sense that if you you know listen to the song the kind of closing line goes all I really want is peace of mind so that that just kind of reflects a very real thing for me. That's really all I really want, right? All the other things that, you know, we chase and all the other things that we want in life, right? Is it really as important as peace of mind at the yeah. end of the day? I, uh, you know? I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, you and I share that common ground with mm. having anxiety like our entire lives. And I yes. was gonna, I was gonna ask, like, what advice would you give a musician, whether they're in Singapore and they've been discouraged, like, no, this scene in for you, la, go back in your corner, <laughs> like, go back to your corner, where, you know, like, or if they're in America, like, anywhere, any music scene, what advice would you give someone who's like at the end of the rope, saying like? Maybe this music thing isn't for me, la. Like when? The... I mean, you've got to decide really uh, in the first place what your priorities are. I guess you have to really decide how important, really, how important is the music actually, right? How important is it? What would you do for the music? And and, and I mean, bottom line, I always think that the music 
really first and foremost is for myself first it's not for anybody else right so yeah. you've got to come to that conclusion first that you are making music to save your life so to speak you're not making music you know to get anybody's attention you're not making music you know to get fans or to make money or this none of those things if those are your priorities then okay then you might have a problem <laughs> yeah. right but if you're really just doing it for yourself first and nothing else matters right then i think the rest right will either fall in place or they won't <laughs> it doesn't matter either way you see mm -hmm. it doesn't matter either way because there is no promise the universe doesn't promise that well if you if you're true to your music you you know you 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 do well or there's no such promise <laughs> right so why is that the expectation so the music has to be its own reward you right. know, full stop full stop you if you have more expectations than that you're just going to get disappointed <laughs> that's all that's really good that's really good and continuing on that note um when you consider your career that you had thus far as a musician as a composer what have you learned about yourself not only as a musician but as a person well i think what i've learned about myself in this journey is, is that i'm just happiest making music for the sake of it yeah right and, and, and anything else just kind of gets in the way of that because to be honest right I am the most natural in my most natural state when I'm making music. It it just comes naturally to me. It's the easiest thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you got to do a lot of things in life, right? Whether it's work or whatever kind of things. And, and, and there's so many things. And, you know, when I make music, there's zero anxiety whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I, I feel safe and comfortable. Right in that space, it's always everything else that, that always is the problem, right? So, like for example, right? So right now, this this you know people say, oh, you know, when are you performing? When are you doing gigs for the to promote the album and stuff like that? And in back of my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> do I really have to kind of do that? Because <coughs> that is stressful to try to get those things done, things like that. Yeah, but you know? in the end, you you persevere. And uh, you you have in another um, in another niche you carved out for yourself. You have the banner of the Lion City Rock podcast that you yeah. do with Chris Toe, and that's yeah. based on uh, you know reliving you know the Singaporean uh, you know music scene from from back in the day. And uh, I mean, you'd be pleased to know that I've inadvertently been a contributor, like working behind the scenes, getting the album scans and the and the yeah. material <laughs> too on Discogs yeah. for your research. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. So yeah, so if, I mean, all credit to Chris actually, uh, because he he he's always been you know very interested to do something, and he's been talking about it to me for some time already. Um, and I, I basically told him, yeah, sure, I'll do it. But, you know, you've got to do all the heavy lifting. Right? Oh, man. I'm just going to turn up and talk. That's all. I'm not going to do anything <laughs> That's else. Good. That's what you yeah, do and, best. <laughs> yeah. And, and, he, and, you know, and he said, yeah, okay. And, to, and he's done everything, you know. So 60 episodes already and, and more coming. Uh, you know, definitely, you know, all credit to him, tip of the hat to, to Chris, and he's really delivered, right? So for me personally, I can tell you, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people say a lot of things to me over, over you know, decades, right? Mm -hmm. Which they never come tr true with it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's a very common thing. Maybe ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people. Yeah, that happens to me too. They're like, "All right, yeah. we're set," and then it's like ghosts. Let's, You're like, yeah, "What?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's do this. So, so I'm just very thankful for for Chris. You know, being one of the exceptions. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> really good. His, like, yeah, yeah, um, but, yeah, 
Yeah, I always tune in when I can, and you definitely have a great thing going. I, I love that you, you spoke with Richard Kahn recently. That's good, because I remember uh, I had the uh, Truck album, and then also October Cherries. I was yeah. listening yeah. to them. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, things like that. So, you know, it, it gives us a chance to, like, talk to Richard. So, I, have to, I mean, I've spoken to Richard before, but to to get him to kind of talk a little bit more in depth about October Cherries and, and Truck. Yeah. I mean, that's just a fantastic experience. So, it's really, like I said, it's more for us than anything else again, right? So, yeah. it's the same kind of principle. We're doing this for us because I enjoy talking to Chris and we're just having fun. Right. So if anybody is else is getting on board and enjoying it and, and getting something out of it, that's really a bonus because it's and, and the best part about it is that initially we were, we, were, we did had some doubts. We we're thinking, do we have enough material? How, how long can this last? And it's just going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's really you know, cool. and it's so much that you want to do and we and we want to talk to more people, including yourself, Jake. We oh, that's you... cool. That's I'd, I'd love to be on sometime whenever you want to have me. We want you to get you on, on an episode. Yeah. We want to get you on an, an episode to talk about, you know, about your own unique perspective on, on Singapore and, and Singapore music scene and things like that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot. I have a lot to say, like a lot of good, a lot contentious, but all, all around positive, man. So... It's really good. I'd be glad to be on. And uh, I guess, lastly, to <coughs> wrap up this interview, anything you'd like to say to your fans? Um, well, just, you know, really, all I really want to say is, that, you know, really, you just need to kind of believe in yourself, right? Um, you know, whatever you're doing <laughs> in life, um, you really got to believe in yourself because as strange as this may sound uh, and, and almost antithetical to a lot of things that we are taught, right? Yes, you know, we need relationships and we need community and all that sort of things. But at the end of the day, all you really have is yourself mm -hmm. first, right? So if you don't believe in yourself and you don't look after yourself, you don't find contentment in yourself, then you know life is is gonna be a difficult challenge. So I, it's yeah. kind of a heavy thing to say, but <laughs> every way to wrap the interview, but it's poignant. You know, it makes sense. 